Hi again, everyone. Welcome to Big 12 Breakdown. This is your place for Big 12 football talk each and every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern Time and 8 o'clock Central Time. This week we bring in uh, Sean Forty from Today's You and also Thomas Fleming from Cowboys Rat Free. Thomas, welcome to the Big 12 Breakdown. This is your initial debut uh, performance here. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you for having me. This is good stuff. So, in addition to recruiting, we've got an interesting uh, uh, forum to talk about uh, a proposed championship game in the Big 12. We'll get to that in just a second. But, of course, National Signing Day is just one week away, and that's the lifeblood of college football. So this is about as important as it gets in regards to bringing in talent uh, to fight for a conference championship. So we're going to tee up Sean first and foremost on just uh, what's caught your eye in the recruiting season thus far as we get close to National Signing Day. Yeah, right now it's really between TCU and Baylor who has the best recruiting class and everything could swing in favor of TCU next week. But right now Baylor's at least had the advantage. They're holding on to five-star offensive of tackle Patrick Hudson who canceled the visit with Oklahoma and Arkansas this past week. He's still going to visit UT, but it really seems that he still likes Art Browse and company to stay there. So replacing Spencer Drango with him is going to be imperative for Baylor, at least, if not this year starting, at least the next few years in the starting place of Drango. And they're also really going hard for Brandon Jones, the top safety in the nation. It'd be the biggest defensive player that Baylor ever lands. It looks like he's going to go to UT, but right now people are really thinking that Jones is going to possibly swing over to Baylor. Chris Dishman, a former all-pro safety at and the NFL, he's a safety coach at Baylor right now, and he's been visiting every recruit with Browse right now. They're trying to get as much notoriety as they can right now, and it, it might be working. They've even been going hard after the number one kicker in the nation. He's from Michigan, and it looks like he's going to go to Michigan. Hard to say no to Harbaugh at this point. But to think that Baylor is going after a number one kicker when they're a team that's not known for kicking, they also pulled Drew Gallitz last year as the number one punter, it, it's really interesting that they're getting any recognition from special teams players right now. But they're trying to become a really well-rounded team, also getting some defensive players like Jones or Bravion Roy, who's a fantastic defensive tackle. It's, it's a good process right now. I think they're in a good spot. Yeah, if you're a punter with uh, uh, eyes toward the NFL in three or four years, I don't know if Baylor's the spot to go. On the other hand, of course, Baylor scores as much as anybody and provides little opportunity for the punter, but in big games, you are at some point going to have to punt the football, and it's a very important task right there. You guys are probably a little bit too young to remember Chris Dishman. He was a, a menace in the secondary for the Houston Oilers, uh, the old Houston Oilers. Very nice. All right, Thomas, uh, we had Gerald Tracy on last week from Cowboys Right for Free. He didn't seem real pleased with the uh, Oklahoma State recruiting class, to say the least. Uh, your, your thoughts about uh, what uh, the hall looks to be at this point, and may, maybe uh, are there any prospects out there that are leaning toward Oklahoma State that would make it a little bit better class? Well, uh, Mark, uh, I, I have to agree with Gerald on this. Oklahoma State hasn't had a a particularly special recruiting class in a while from our perspective. Uh, and that's not really what they try to do. Uh, under the Ger Gundy era, they've really tried to get two, three-star players and work them uh, and improve them over time under uh, Rob Glass, the strength and conditioning coach. They don't go after a whole lot of four- and five-star recruits, uh, which is their decision. That uh, It's what they've been sticking to for a while, and they've been uh, fairly successful with it, but it's not necessarily something that will catch an eye of a fan. Uh, this particular season, uh, in the 2016 recruiting class, they have some talent. Uh, their offensive line, as uh, many people have realized by this point, uh, struggled uh, this past season. They struggled in 2014, but OSU has brought in five offensive line commits, uh, and there's some big boys. They have potential to, uh, a number of them have the potential to squeak into that starting lineup, the starting five uh, in this upcoming season. Um, Taylor Brown is someone who comes to mind. He's 6'5", 320, from Lexington, Oklahoma. Uh, 
Tevin Jenkins. He comes from Topeka, Kansas. He's 6'6", 300 pounder, a lot of talent there. Uh, and uh, upcoming, looking forward uh, to the next coming month or so, Tremonda Moore is an offensive lineman who a lot of people are looking at. Um, and he's really between OU and OSU right now. I'd probably give the lean to Oklahoma, um, but he's certainly someone who could come in and contribute right away. Defensively, there's not a whole lot of uh, recruits that really pop out. One that really catches my eye is um, a player co- uh, named Amin Ogbong Bamiga, and he comes from uh, Canada. And he is the second cousin of Emmanuel Ogba, who just declared for the 2016 NFL draft. And he has played Canadian football. He's fairly new to the sport, but he uh, has the athleticism of his second cousin, and I think he could become a uh, really talented player for OSU in the coming years. Well, Mike Gundy's been able to parlay these two- and three-star loaded classes into, let's say, a team that made the Fiesta Bowl, of course, in the most successful season, that 2011 campaign, a Cotton Bowl appearance a couple years ago. This past uh, team that uh, won the first two ten games and made it all the way to the Sugar Bowl. So it depends on the expectations because if this is going to be the result of, of, of two and three star loaded classes, it, they're definitely uh, outperforming the recruiting rankings. But at the same time, are Oklahoma State fans, do you think Thomas, expecting more, expecting to take the big leap to, to play with the big boys on the national stage? Uh, a lot of us have been calling that uh, calling for that for a while now. Um, but it, it's just... It's not gotten to that point. Uh, OSU had a, a a couple of recruits, a good handful, uh, decommit in the past uh, three months or so. Uh, Nick Starkle is one uh, quarterback uh, who is now with Texas A&M. Um, even going back to last year, running back uh, Ronald Jones decommitted and went to USC. So a lot of the bigger recruits have unfortunately decommitted. Levi Draper is someone else. He is uh, the top linebacker recruit in Oklahoma, a 2017 recruit, and he decommitted, and he's headed to Oklahoma uh, as of now. So uh, it's been rough on the Cowboys this past couple of years because those big-time four- five-star recruits have just uh, made different decisions. They've uh, gone elsewhere, and OSU has been left with these three-star guys who have performed well, you know, uh, you think of a guy like Jalen McCleskey. He was only a three-star coming into last year, but he had uh, quite a bit of production. James Washington, I believe he was a two-star coming out of high school. So there's talent there, and they're very good at finding talent, but uh, OSU, uh, for one reason or another, isn't able to attract those four to five stars on a regular basis. And as soon as you mention five-star recruits, there's not a whole lot of those guys out there. There's typically, depending on your service, maybe 35 or 40 across the nation. Mm-hmm. So that's really the elite uh, of the recruiting class. Uh, Sean, you've got your finger on the pulse of Big 12 football. When you think Oklahoma State, do you think that, okay, the success has come from these lower-tiered recruiting classes and, and uh, maybe the program's reached its ceiling and we can't expect much more? But at the same time, we've seen more out of the Baylor and TCU's two programs that we wouldn't have expected maybe five, six years ago to be able to play at an elite level on a national stage. So can we expect more out of Oklahoma State, do you think? No, like Thomas was saying, it seems that that's what their bread and butter is right now. They like to go for those smaller talents that they can develop later and keep progressing as they stay within the program. And... But right now the ceiling is that Oklahoma's there. It's going to take a while to have someone say, oh, I want to go to OSU over OU. OSU, they were very good this year, and it's surprising to see them lose recruits like Nick Starkle to A&M. But it's just strange that that's happening right now, considering the success, and that they're not trying to go off of what they've built in the past few years, especially this year. We might see the next few years, but right now, as long as Oklahoma's as good as they are right now, it's going to be hard to pull those recruits for five stars. All right, and after training day coming up next Wednesday, hopefully we can pull in a number of bloggers from across the conference and uh, get the lay of the land uh, once all the uh, the names are on the dotted lines. All right, uh, the lack of a conference championship game may have cost the Big 12 in 2014. We know the situation with TCU and Baylor versus Ohio State may have cost the conference a a shot at the college football playoff. 
Uh, here we stand one year later after the conference was able to get into the playoff because of the Stanford two-loss team being compared to an Oklahoma one-loss team and the other one-loss teams from the other conferences. Twelve teams was the requirement at one point and still is, but uh, the other conferences have seen clear to allow the Big 12 to institute the conference championship game with only ten teams. So it brings up an interesting quandary and I'll kind of lay it out there for you guys. You've got ten teams and I think in many respects it's the truest championship in college football because everybody already plays everyone and we don't have a situation where two teams don't play and much like the SEC and the Big Ten and the ACC in particular with 14 teams you have eight conference games so you have teams not playing five teams from your conference. It's the truest championship. At the same time, people love conference championship games, makes the conference a ton of money, and it aligns the Big 12 with everyone else in regards to the requirements to make it into the college football playoff, or at least meeting one requirement of making it into the college football playoff. But you have this issue with 10 teams, and everyone plays everyone. And as we discussed before we hit the record button, if you have a format where first place plays second place, that's fine, but those two teams have already played and one of them has already won that game, and so even if those two teams are tied for the conference championship, going into the conference championship game, you have 8-1 Oklahoma taking on 8-1 Texas, but they already played and one team, in a sense, broke the tiebreaker. On the other hand, the other issue I would see is if you've got an undefeated Big 12 team within conference 9-0, and taking on, let's say, a second place team, or maybe you've got a horde of 6-3 and three teams tied for second place, and really it's unfair to match that 9-0 and team that's already proved itself to be the best, where it uh, exposes itself to an upset bid against an inferior team, and it hurts the conference in trying to get into the college football playoff. So, Sean, we'll start with you just in regards to how you would possibly begin to sort out that mess. It's definitely a mess, and I see all the points that the number one team, number two team are going to play, and it could be heavily skewed in the favor of number one, especially if it's an undefeated team. I, I don't think it's going to happen. There's a lot of parity within the conference right now, so you're probably going to get maybe just one team with a one-win advantage. But I'm looking back to two years ago, or like last season, when TCU and Baylor were fighting it out for the the last spot in the playoffs. Both of them missed out eventually. 61-58, that's going to live forever in Big 12 lore. And, and both of those schools would have given anything to play each other again. I can guarantee that the number one team, number two team in the conference, should this conference title turn out as it looks like it will, that they're, it's going to have been a close game, and fans and the teams are going to want to see if that was just a fluke whether it's at a neutral location or at someone's home stadium, someone's going to want to prove that it should not have been that way and we're a better team right now than we were, say, a month ago. Hey, Thomas, do you have any thoughts on how this could possibly work? I think it's good to have a conference championship game, but it's just the dynamic of only having 10 teams that makes it difficult. Uh, logistically, it is flawed with a 10 team conference, and especially you have no divisions. Uh, I mean, that's the point of the Big 12, as it is a round-robin conference, but uh, there will be issues if that were to be the case. Uh, hypothetically, uh, let's say uh, if Baylor beats TCU in the regular season, and then TCU beats Baylor, who maybe was going undefeated into that conference championship, uh, TCU beats Baylor in the conference championship, you'd hear quite a bit of gripes from the Baylor fans, and obviously that doesn't matter, but it, it does point out a discrepancy. Baylor uh, should be the conference champion in that hypothetical. They were undefeated headed into that uh, conference championship, so it's flawed. Uh, I see why people would consider to have a conference championship because uh, Big 12 has been held out of the uh, playoff uh, other than this coming year, but uh, in the past year with TCU and Baylor, but I I think if the Big 12 uh, wrote it out, um, it might not be an issue. Uh, there will be a lot of good teams. Oklahoma is slated to be in the top five for next season. Baylor and TCU, they're right there. Um, OSU, for some particular reason, has been uh, put as high as five. Um, 
So the Big 12 will be right there, in my opinion. I don't think a conference championship is imperative at this point in time. If they were to expand, get two more teams, then you could look up, uh, look into making divisions and creating your own conference championship once again. But at this point in time, it's not entirely necessary. I would provide like a wild card situation in baseball, at least an advantage to the regular season champion, I guess you could call them the first place team by providing them a home game mm -hmm. to give them a slight advantage over the second place team. I know most of these conference championships love to pick out kind of a glitzy neutral site and, and play the conference championship there, but uh, Arrowhead Stadium was never that glitzy and they, they hosted plenty of Big 12 championship games, so it, it could work from that standpoint. You know, I should have set the trend here, guys. When we started talking hypothetical situations, it would have been nice to include, let's say, Kansas. For once, we could have said, you know, if Kansas is first place and uh, Iowa State's in second place <sighs> and proceeded that way, that, that would at least brought those it's two. Not basketball. Got basketball. Yeah, uh, just thinking about that makes my head hurt, honestly. Uh, I mean, no offense to those two programs, but uh, I... I just don't see that happening even in hypotheticals. Well, Thomas, this is your first time on, and as you can imagine, we never talk about Iowa State and Kansas, so that would have been a nice thing maybe for them that it, we would have at least brought them into a hypothetical situation as uh, playing for a conference championship. Honestly, uh, as an OSU fan, I, I, I'm always a little bit leery about uh, Iowa State. They played OSU well uh, last season, and they have a running back who I, I can't necessarily remember his Mike name, Warren. but he's yes, he's going to be an all-conference player uh, by the time he leaves ISU, in my opinion. He is a very talented player, and um, it's, a, it's a talented team. They're always right there every season. They'll have a lot of tight games, but, you know, for one reason or another, they can't put together a, a, a true successful season. But they have a new head coach, so we'll see what happens. And I know you played him in 2011. Yeah, that was that was a tough game, but uh, they got a marquee win out of that, so, you know, kudos to them. All right, guys, this is Big 12 Breakdown. It's uh, one week away from National Signing Day on February the 3rd. So for Sean Cordy from Today's You and Thomas Fleming from Cowboys Ride for Free, I'm Mark Rogers of Mark Rogers TV. We do this each and every week talking of the Big 12. Guys, appreciate you coming on. Thank Thanks, you.